Welcome to the Modern Intimacy Podcast, a show about mental health, sex, relationships, education and tips, and those private things we need to talk about more publicly without restrictions. I'm your host, Dr. Kate Balistrieri, a licensed psychologist, certified sex therapist, packed couples therapist, and sex addiction therapist. I know that mental health is directly tied to the quality of our relationships and our sex lives. I'm passionate in my desire to smash stigmas and shine a light on societal issues that may be negatively affecting our lives, relationships, and sexuality. During this podcast, I will also give you practical answers and insights to questions you've been wondering about. We should all have fulfilled, happy lives, and we get there by erasing shame, consciously digging deeper, building healthy connections, and by getting curious together. Thanks for joining me. Let's get started. Joining me today is Rachel Overball. Rachel is a somatic sex and intimacy coach at Modern Intimacy and the author of the book, Finding Feminism. Rachel lives in Colorado and works with clients to move beyond shame, to step into safety in their bodies and to live a life embodied in pleasure. Using her credentials from the Somatica Institute and Kinsey Institute, Rachel works through the mediums of embodiment and self-attunement to help clients step outside of shame and into the power of their authentic selves. And Rachel, I am so grateful that you are willing to come on this episode and talk about your experience with purity culture um, as a professional, but also as a person. So can you tell us a little bit about kind of what purity culture is and how you, how it influences kids as they're growing up in it. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so excited too. So the first thing I would say is I talk about my own experience through the lens of evangelical Christianity, purity okay. culture, but purity culture is really prevalent in a lot of high control religions. It is. Um, so if I mention like Christianity throughout this, that doesn't negate anyone's experience in other religions within this modality of mm-hmm. control over women's bodies. Cause that's really what it is. Mm-hmm. It's, it's conflating women's worth specifically. I'll talk about women mostly um, throughout this episode of people socialized female um, with their virginity and their mm-hmm. purity who are mm-hmm. worth more if you are pure and there's different mediums of controlling that and different rules for different sects of religion. I know I went to churches where it was like, you don't even hold hands until you're engaged, right? Mm. No touching at all. I went to churches where it was like, our first kiss is our wedding day. So there's a lot of different nuances and how this would show up. Mm -hmm. The main thing to understand that it's control over women's bodies in the form of sexual oppression. I think that's really um, important to focus on. uh, So often, I think folks think about purity culture as a positive aspect of their religious upbringing, and they see it as a celebration of their spirituality, but embedded so deep within these religious frameworks is exactly what you said. It's a high level of misogyny that is organized and that shows up in the form of oppression of women and women's sexuality as if women's sexuality is in any way shape or form tied to their worth as human beings and that's one of the biggest um, culprits of purity culture in my opinion Mm -hmm. absolutely and i think it's really interesting too that some people think it is like this amazing piece of their spiritual journey Mm -hmm. Because what I see from purity culture personally in my own life, in the life of my sister as well, who I'm really close with, who's also left, and my clients is this piece that it it instills in women is a deep hatred of our bodies, Mm -hmm. a deep hatred of our bodies. We can't trust our bodies because Mm -hmm. they're sinful and they're evil and they cause men to stumble. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about this from like really heterosexual language because that's the That's language, the language of of, culture. Yeah, right. Um, so, mm-hmm. so it's, it instills this just like deep hatred of your body and this deep mistrust of your body. I can't trust my body. I can't enjoy my body. My body is something that is evil that causes people to sin. It causes me to sin. It causes men to sin. I have to be removed and disassociated. There's such an imbalance of responsibility that's put on the shoulders of girls and women in a purity Mm -hmm. culture environment. Why 
what happens to men? How are they socialized around purity culture, boys and men? Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to say that purity culture does affect men too. Mm -hmm. I've worked with male clients that have been deeply affected by this. I think it just affects us differently in the fact that women hold more responsibility within Mm -hmm. the module or the modality of purity culture Mm -hmm. than men. Men, what I see when I work with male clients is um, specifically this this struggle around viewing women as people, Mm -hmm. even if they really, they're like, I want to view women as people. And I have this deep ingrained belief that like women are bodies, women are receptacles. Mm. Um, and so that's a, that's something that I see when I work with men specifically is this struggle to view women as people and mm-hmm. also to view women's pleasure as important to their relationship. Meaning they don't view women's pleasure as important to the relationship outside of how it serves their own pleasure. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Or they've never even thought about women's pleasure. That too. They're like, I've never even thought about my partner, my female partner's pleasure ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it really does reinforce this bifurcation of women as being in service of different needs for men, right? They're in service of their sexual pleasure, to use your word, they become a receptacle mm-hmm. for their sexuality. And then if they remain pure and chaste, they become a receptacle for their redemption right? Mm. And for men's connection to a sense of their own purity through the purity of the women with whom they associate. Yeah, that is so true. And I see that a lot in my own experiences and the experiences of clients as well. Yeah. So how does someone begin to recognize purity culture messaging and start to unpack it? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, (laughs) It's a deeply personal journey for all of us, Mm -hmm. what I would say. And I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do it. Um, It's And recognizing that it's an ongoing journey, I would say, is the biggest thing. I'm Mm -hmm. 31 and I've left 11 years ago. I've been out for 10 years. Like, Mm -hmm. And there are still thoughts that come into my head that I know are not mine, that are Mm -hmm. purity culture. Being in my 30s and single, Mm-hmm. a huge one that I've struggled with is like I'm not worth anything because I'm not married and mm-hmm. I know that I don't hold that belief that's mm-hmm. not a personal belief of mine but it's one that comes up in my head and it's a story that like comes through sometimes and mm-hmm. so recognizing the first thing is what is my story and what is the story I've been told mm-hmm. right that's when you start to differentiate between what is my truth and what's the truth I've been taught mm-hmm. because my truth is that I love my life. I've never met anyone that I wanted to marry. I feel great. I'm loving this journey in my Mm -hmm. thirties of not having children and not being married. Mm -hmm. The story that I've been taught to believe is that I'm not worth anything, that no one wants me, that I'm invaluable. Mm -hmm. We're seeing a lot of that discourse continue in, um, in channels and and in conversations that maybe it's not so obvious that it's still rooted in purity culture. You know, when I see people having conversations about um, like masculine and feminine polarities or Mm. high value men, high value women, low value men, low value women, that language is all a manifestation of purity culture. And it serves to reinforce these, um, these ideas, again, that women are sort of uh, held to a different standard than boys and men um, when it comes to thinking about how they derive personal worth and spiritual worth, right? Access into an afterlife that feels safe and meaningful. Absolutely. And it's so important then when we're hearing these messages to determine like, is this something I truly believe for myself or is it something I was taught and socialized around. Yeah. And the truth is, is if you're listening to this and you grew up in the United States, even if you didn't go to church, you have experienced purity culture because I'm assuming you have gone to schooling of some type. Right. What is what is a really good example of purity culture? Modesty and dress mm-hmm. code that shows up even in public schools, right? You can't wear mm-hmm. spaghetti straps because mm-hmm. what if because you're gonna distract the boys? Right. That's purity culture. Like that is, yeah. That, you know, your skirt has to be a certain length because what if you distract the boys, right? It's also 
it's, it's purity culture from two aspects, purity culture in the fact that it's super cis and heteronormative, mm-hmm. purity culture in the fact that it's also controlling women's bodies and putting the pressure and the burden on them to keep men in line. As if they can, as if girls and, right. and women have any ability to control the behaviors of men. If that were true, we wouldn't see sexual assault statistics the way that we do, right? With over... of the people affected and victimized by sexual violence being women or feminine presenting Mm -hmm. folks. And um, I think in even higher statistic in the 90 percentile um, perpetrators being male. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a women's issue. It's not. No, no. Um, So let's think a little bit more about how does purity culture, how can it impact someone's relationship with their own sexuality? Mm, I think the biggest thing is that it takes you away from a relationship. You can't Mm -hmm. actually have a relationship with your own sexuality if you're following these rigid, moralistic, fear-mongering rules. Mm -hmm. Like, how can I have a relationship with my own sexuality if all I'm doing is like being a good little soldier and marching the way I was told without questioning or understanding what is it that I want, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What is it that I want to experience in intimacy, in relationships, in sex? How, and if I can't answer those questions, which purity culture doesn't allow, how can I have a relationship with my own sexuality? I can't. Right, right. So I'm hearing that it really disconnects people from their own experience of pleasure and makes it, um, really like amplifies how performative it can be, right? Sex is a performance that I do, that I give under this particular framework so that I'm in line with whatever I believe to be the rules. Mm -hmm. And we're focused on doing and our worth coming from doing, right? I'm worthy Mm -hmm. if I'm performing. I'm worthy if I am um, being a a good wife and having sex Mm -hmm. with my husband every week, right? That's Mm -hmm. I'm worthy if I'm doing you're never going to be able to experience pleasure because pleasure is about being. Pleasure isn't about doing. Mm, right. The only way we can experience pleasure is by practicing being. I'm really glad that you brought that up because I think purity culture can create a context and an expectation that sex is an obligation. And what a lot of people fail to recognize is that when there is sexual entitlement and an obligation to be sexual, it really has an inverse relationship with sexual desire. So it's difficult Mm -hmm. to cultivate desire and to feel truly inspired for sex. And our body shuts down to the experience of sexuality, really reinforcing the idea that we are a repository for someone else's pleasure. I mean, in a very implicit and visceral way. Yeah, absolutely. It sets up all of those to feel them in our bodies and to feel like, how can I desire someone when it's my duty? Desire, we talked about this last night in the workshop, desire in order for it to be present, we have to have something that's drawing us into curiosity and exploration. Duty is not curiosity. Mm -mm. Duty is not exploration. Mm -mm. If we want to desire, there has to be things present that draw us into that curiosity and exploration. Mm -hmm. And that's not duty. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you think the purity culture and this dynamic that we're talking about of obligation and duty, how does it enhance or erode relationships when people have been in long-term relationships? I think it's when people have been in long-term relationships and if let's say, especially if you were in purity culture, you probably got married pretty young. Mm -hmm. probably didn't, I'm going to make some generalizations. You probably didn't have a ton of experience in relationships and intimacy with other people. Mm -hmm. Um, So what I've seen with clients and um, with people I've also just personally known is there can be some resentment that comes up Mm -hmm. when you start to unpack, right? Resentment of like, and sometimes it shows up towards the partner. Sometimes it's internal resentment. Sometimes mm-hmm. it's just resentment for the structure as a whole, but that's the first thing I really notice mm-hmm. is when people start to unpack, there's a deep level of resentment of like, I didn't get to experience X, Y, Z. I, yeah. I didn't know that there was that, that. I had a client tell me this once. I wish I would have known that when I was 26, not getting married and not having children was an option. I didn't even know that was an option. Wow. Wow. So there's such a foreclosure on the possibilities in life when somebody grows up really entrenched in purity culture and 
they are not only asked, but demanded into a life that has been dictated for them. And I think when people settle into that life, it's really natural that they start to question whether or not there's goodness of fit. Most of us do that, whether we grew up in right. purity culture or not. Once we get comfortable in a situation, we can look at it with fresh eyes and say, how does this really fit for me? And what do I like or not like about this situation that I'm in? And so I think when when I've worked with folks who are unpacking some of this um, impact in their lives, one of the things that I come up against, and I wonder if you've ever experienced this with clients, is a, the resentment that you mentioned, but also a, a lot of anger that they have mixed feelings about and don't know if it's okay to feel. And it's anger at themselves sometimes, anger at their parents, anger at their community, anger at their partner, and sometimes even anger at their God. Yeah, absolutely. I think once you recognize, like I've been pushed into this belief system, I never mm -hmm. had choice and I just followed along and maybe I, I feel like I lost years of my life or maybe I feel like I missed out on experiences too. And when you come to recognize all of that, there's absolutely mm -hmm. anger. Mm -hmm. And I love clients who are like, I am angry and I know that's bad. It's not bad. Right? It's not bad. It's not bad. <laughs> no, it's necessary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, of course you would be angry. It's, it's mm -hmm. how do I use my anger, right? right? Is it, if I use my anger to yell at my partner and be like, I fucking hate you. You're the worst thing ever. I can't believe we did this. That's probably not productive anger. <laughs> Correct. But if I'm just feeling angry, that's okay. It's okay to experience the emotion of anger. And it mm -hmm. not only is it okay, it's needed in order it for is. you to move out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I can't echo that loud enough. I think anger is something that when folks find themselves in these high control religious situations, anger is not really allowed. Um, mm -hmm. right. And questioning isn't really allowed. So a lot of people who I've worked with really find themselves in this double bind where they recognize that there's uh, a stuckness because to move through and make sense of the impact of purity culture on one's life requires questioning. It requires anger. It requires a reconciliation sometimes of spiritual beliefs and beliefs that may be deeply important to someone, but a reality of disconnection from pleasure and sexuality and um, an experience of connection to our sexuality that can feel so, um, difficult to find and to access. Yeah, absolutely. And to add on to that, it's just this, this deep, deep disconnection that you feel. And when you were talking, I was thinking about a specific client that I worked with where she was like, well, I think I, I think I do believe that I don't want to have sex until I'm married. I think that is a belief I have. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, tell me about that. Like, mm -hmm. why is that a belief that you have? She's like, well, I don't want someone to, to like use me and I don't want to feel like I'm just discarded. Mm. And it's like, and so we went through a couple more sessions with some deep questioning because even in that belief, it's like, you're still equating your value to with what you do. Purity. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's how deeply entrenched this belief system can be. I mm -hmm. mean, I've worked with clients who have been declared atheists for the majority of their adult lives, and they feel really comfortable in that ideology. It makes sense for them. And they may not consciously feel like their sexuality and their worth are tied together, but they find themselves in the dating world and they do experience people using them for sex and manipulating them for sex. And they do experience people shaming them for mm -hmm. being open to being sexual. So I think sometimes the reinforcing aspects of a culture that is so closely steeped in religious ideation, even though we live in a country that ostensibly has a separation of church and state, mm -hmm. um, we see in the culture that there are so many people parroting um, the ideas of purity culture without really having a full understanding of how they came to have those beliefs. And so it gets reinforced and regurgitated, even for folks who have really challenged, um, you know, a religious framework in their own minds. Absolutely. It's so entrenched. 
and mm -hmm. even like you were saying kind of the new age spirituality that shows up with the like polarities right and so many people love that and buy into it and and without recognizing that it's like deeply rooted in purity culture right it is yeah and I, I think it's a really um I appreciate that so many folks really lean into that and they find it to be more accessible than maybe some of the directly religious and patriarchal and oppressive language around mm -hmm. gender differences and double standards, but it is repackaged misogyny and it is repackaged um, uh, oppression, right? That's mm -hmm. sort of been whitewashed and sanitized in this new age spiritual, um, elevated, I'm going to put that word in quotes, conversation about sex and worth and um, roles. So I think it can be a really dangerous trap that folks find themselves in thinking that they are elevating their consciousness. And in some ways they might be, but they do seem to kind of perpetuate a lot of the same dance moves that happen in purity culture. Absolutely, they do. <laughs> Yeah. So when you think about working with people who are um, really trying to reconnect with pleasure, what are some of the things that uh, you recognize are important for them as they're starting to really explore and reconnect with sexual pleasure? I'd say the first thing is that I ask clients is like, what feels accessible, right? Mm -hmm. So for people that have you know, grown up in purity culture and maybe never experienced pleasure, the idea of me telling them like, go home and your homework is to masturbate might feel really inaccessible. They might, mm. I have no idea how to do that. I don't know where to start. Sure. I'm going to feel so ashamed. So like what feels accessible mm. is, is taking a moment in the morning to like put lotion on your legs and like marvel at how amazing it is that your legs got you out of bed this morning and, or that you are walking or doing whatever you're doing with your day and just experiencing mm -hmm. some gratitude while you gently touch your body that's pleasure right does mm -hmm. that feel accessible does um maybe just like laying a hand on your breast and just like holding does that feel accessible so really talking about what is a good access point that's not going to feel overwhelming it's not going to cause you to feel immense amount of shame it's going to feel exciting for you and knowing that it's okay to take baby steps. You don't have to go like full blown into a daily masturbation practice. Right. You can start slow, just like hugging your body while you're naked. Mm -hmm. um, but really thinking about like what feels accessible and a little plug to if you've not, if no one's heard of it is Dipsia. It's an audible erotica app mm -hmm. and they have really great uh, self-touch breath work on there. Oh, that wow. I've recommended to a lot of clients that are kind of coming out of the purity culture and learning to experience pleasure. Um, it's this somatic coach from Australia and she walks you through breath work and self-touch and it's very accessible, very, very like easy entry point. Mm. That feels so important, right? Because the, the last thing that we would want anyone to do is feel obligated to jump into a sexual experience that creates more overwhelm than it does pleasure. So I really think it's mm -hmm. important to honor a gradual introduction into sensual and sexual exploration, if that's what feels right. Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. And and recognizing that like there's not a rush, you can take mm -hmm. your time and you can go at the pace that you need to go at. Yeah. How would you recommend somebody start this conversation with a partner and talk about kind of what they're, what they're thinking through and how it might influence their sex life together? Yeah. So basically deconstructing with a partner. <laughs> yeah. I have, I have not experienced that personally, um, but I have worked with clients that have, mm -hmm. and, my, uh, and my sister and my brother-in-law did that together. And I know I can share a little bit about her um, with her, her permission that's been given um, is I know that she was super scared to start talking to him about it. Yeah. They got married really young. They were, it was terrifying for her to be like, how mm -hmm. do I tell my husband that our entire relationship is based on this faith that I don't think I believe in this faith anymore. Mm -hmm. And I don't, and I, not only do I not believe in it, I'm recognizing the harm that it's done. Mm -hmm. And that's a, so I just say that to share that this is a hard conversation and it is not easy to begin. Um, yeah. 
It, it, it is a really challenging conversation because it brings in these sort of intersecting domains of our lives and it's not clean or easy sometimes. I don't like the word clean in this context and I don't mean it sexually, but it, the, mm -hmm. the lines are not clean um, because mm -hmm. we are sort of talking about spirituality and religion and identity in addition to sexual pleasure. So we're not just having a one dimensional conversation. It brings up a lot for people and it's understandable that there would be fear and um, a lot of potential changes in, in your Absolutely. life and in your relationship that may be difficult to face. Yeah. And I've worked with couples who have gone through this and then they're like, I think we want to open up our marriage because mm -hmm. we've never experienced things. And so I've, I've helped walk them through some ethical non-monogamy or conventional non-monogamy steps. And I think the biggest thing to remember is that this is hard and honor that. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy. You, you don't know how the conversation is going to go because you're not sure what your partner is thinking or feeling. Mm -hmm. And it is deeply personal. So I can't give blanket advice on how to have this because this is such a deeply personal conversation to have with a partner. It is. And, and there are also some safety risks to take into consideration, yeah. right? When folks are really steeped in purity culture, there may also be power imbalances that are inherent in relationships and real concerns about financial safety and security, mm -hmm. um, physical safety and security, sexual and spiritual. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, there's so much going on. And I, mm -hmm. I love that you brought up the power dynamics. That's a huge part of high control religion mm -hmm. relationships is mm -hmm. power dynamics. Whether yes. they are um, explicit or implicit, they are there. They are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's built into the understanding of how relationships, quote unquote, should look in those kinds yeah. of um ideologies. Well, one of the things that I've found pretty helpful for folks who are starting this deconstruction work and really starting to reconnect with themselves differently is to talk with people who have been through this process and to build a support system of folks who have already asked themselves some of these questions and who might be just a little bit further along um, and, and maybe maybe inside their own community, but sometimes it can be helpful outside of their own community so that there is a little extra safety in being able to explore without having to um, experience some of the ripple effects while you're still making sense of what your own truth can be. Absolutely. Yeah, there's so many great communities to be a part of. Mm -hmm. What I would caution people of is some of the communities um, want to tell their trauma stories over and over again. So be cautious of communities that might feel re-traumatizing. That is so wise, <laughs> yeah. so wise. Um, what are some of the resources that you would recommend in terms of books or other podcasts or articles, mm -hmm. um, communities online that can help people really start to access deconstructing um, the effects of purity culture in their own lives? Yeah, I would say the first thing in the book that I found randomly in a library that helped me on this journey and started it is The Beauty Myth by Jessica Valenti. Oh, That's she's a great a, book. Just, she's a brilliant author. She's such a great author. I'm mm -hmm. also really glad she's on TikTok, finally. <laughs> yes. I'm loving her TikTok. Um, and so The Purity Myth, and then I would say um, She Comes First. Mm. great one mm -hmm. by Ian Kerner um and especially if you are in a heterosexual relationship um having your male partner read that as well is so really key, important just for you um yeah. <laughs> and additionally I would say come as you are those are all I love these books because they're all very um informative but they're mm -hmm. very entry level which yeah. when you're coming out of purity culture and you are like I have no sex education I don't know anything about sex this world can feel really overwhelming mm -hmm. and you can it can feel shame you can feel shame or guilt just by asking a question because you're like I should know this right I'm, I'm 40 years old why don't I know this and so recognizing that these are all really great resources to help alleviate some of that shame or like mm -hmm. I should know this feeling and allow you to have easy entry and access points. And then also um, the principles of pleasure is great on Netflix. It's three part docu-series, mm -hmm. um, super, super phenomenal. And watch that with a partner too. Great, great. Um, 
Well, we've got a couple of questions that have come in on this topic. Are you game to answer some? Yeah, let's go. Okay, amazing. So one person wrote in and said, where do you start if you grew up in a Catholic household that never talked about sex? Hmm. Yeah, I, the first thing I would ask this person is like, what's your comfortability around talking about sex? Mm -hmm. So is it like a one, I'm not comfortable at all? Is it a five, I'm a little bit comfortable? Is it a 10 of like, I feel really comfortable, I just don't feel like I know enough? Um, really gauging that first. And mm -hmm. then once again, talking about like what feels accessible for you to learn and what feels accessible for you to start to have these dialogues. So say this person, maybe they're asking a question because they want to talk to their partner about sex and they don't know how. Mm -hmm. um, the first thing I would tell them is like, let's get you to decipher some of your desires around sex mm -hmm. so that I can come to my partner with um, conversations that have also a need or a want being met. Not just like, I think I want more sex. Right. It's not helpful, right? <laughs> um, I would like more sex because it makes me feel desired. It makes me feel close to you. And I would like more of this type of sex because I'm interested in it. Yeah. So when we come to our partners about this being really clear on what we want to, mm. and that can be hard if you grow up in a, uh, like a culture that didn't talk about sex. Clarity around conversations around sex mm -hmm. are really hard because you're just like, let me just use all my courage you say this one sentence of I want more sex and then you're like I used it all up I'm done like I don't have any courage <laughs> to say anything I really appreciate you saying that I mean ambiguity can really light up a lot of fear in our brains so when we mm -hmm. do get up enough courage to sort of bring the one big question or the one big statement out there if there's not um a structure or a path for that conversation. Mm -hmm. It can sometimes bring up more fear in one or both partners because there's now a hot potato in the room and we don't know what to do with it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. really determining like, what is it that I want and desire? And what is it that I want to talk to my partner about within mm -hmm. this realm? Mm -hmm. And then also you can leverage things that are not in-person communication. If the idea of talking about sex in person feels like you can't even get it out of your throat, mm -hmm. write a note, mm -hmm. you send a text message. It's okay to leverage other pieces of communication. It doesn't mean that you're not good. It doesn't mean that you're bad. It just mm -hmm. means that you're on the journey to learning to feel comfortable talking about that. Yeah, I really appreciate that too. Um, it's important when people are starting to think about sex and their relationship with sex differently that they give themselves permission to not know things you know, to really mm -hmm. piggyback on what you said earlier. I think so often we, we can get stuck in shame around the shoulds, I should know this, or I should have experienced that, or I should have already asked this question or thought this thought. But it's really key to recognize that part of purity culture, regardless of the religious faction in which you experienced it, purity culture is about keeping you not in the know. And so mm -hmm. it was not safe for you to know these things before. It wasn't safe to ask these questions before. It wasn't safe to be curious. If it were, that would have been permissible within the structure mm -hmm. of your religious um, experience. And what I mean by it's not safe is it wasn't, it wasn't allowed. And so to be curious would have meant to be rebellious. And so when people sort of snuff out their curiosity and they stop thinking about how to engage in pleasure, that's a survival strategy in a high control religious situation. So I think it's really important to honor that part of you that got you through all of that. And as you start to um, ask these questions within yourself and, and potentially within a relationship, it's okay to not know and it's okay to feel clumsy in how you're asking the questions or even thinking about it because that's how we learn. Absolutely, absolutely. And and when you're having these conversations, practicing like sexual empathy is mm -hmm. key. Mm -hmm. Practicing um, curiosity with our partners if they say something that they want or that they're looking to experience. Mm -hmm. um, really having open doors for that without causing more shame. And that can be really difficult too when you're working through your own shame stories around sex. So Absolutely. if this feels difficult and you're like, I don't even know how to have the conversation, hiring a professional to help mediate the conversation 
you don't have to do this alone. There's lots mm-hmm. of people to help you. This, you do not have to do this alone. That's so true. That's so true. There, there are many professionals who specialize in helping people move through their own fog around this topic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. And we've got one more question. How do I begin a new relationship with my spirituality, which is important to me, after I recognize the negative impacts of purity culture? That's such an important question. It's such an important question. Mm -hmm. I think for my own story, I had to go completely atheist in order Mm -hmm. for me to even open up the box again, because Mm -hmm. I was so, and I I see this happen with a lot of clients too, and that's why I'm sharing my experience is um, this, this full pendulum swing of like, I believe something so fervently and Mm -hmm. it was all a lie Mm -hmm. or most of it was a lie, whatever you decide for you. And now I can't trust anything. So I really have to put this pendulum swing together. I did not believe in anything for a while Mm -hmm. until I can start deciding what it is that is truly mine. And Mm -hmm. for me and for a lot of clients, that's a really important part of their journey because in this in this realm of not believing in anything, you start to believe in yourself. Mm, so and true. when you start to believe in yourself, you can start to reimagine what spirituality looks like for you outside of the rules you were taught. And I'm not saying that this is like everyone should go atheist. <laughs> I'm just, this is a common journey that I see mm-hmm. among people. And recognizing that like spirituality and religion, if that's what you choose within spirituality, it's, it's all about the purpose of it is to, first of all, make us better humans, if you mm-hmm. believe in it, and to give us hope. Mm-hmm. That's what really spirituality is about. So you're allowed to create belief systems that give you those things. Mm-hmm. And even if it's, if you find like, okay, I really like crystals. Like if I, if I die one day and I realize crystals were dumb and they didn't mean anything, it doesn't really matter because like for my 80 years on earth, they brought me a lot of joy and hope. So mm. recognizing that like you're allowed to have hope and joy in the beliefs that you have. Your beliefs should not be ones of shame. They shouldn't be ones mm-hmm. of guilt. They shouldn't be ones of fear. If your beliefs are those, then I would ask you to re-examine them. Mm-hmm. I really love that. And, and it reminds me of a study that I was looking at recently and its name I can't remember, but I'll try to find it for the show notes. But it was a study that was examining the flight from religion that's been happening mm. with millennials and Gen Z. And they were talking about how fewer and fewer folks in those generations identify as religious at all. And, and in fact, there's a growing population of people who identify as atheist and agnostic. And they were looking at sort of what the function of religion has served for many people and how the Gen Zers and the millennials were getting those same needs met. So some of the things that they identified were community, a -hmm. source of support, um, a source of identity, right? And really feeling connected to a purpose. And so they looked at how were people who were now identifying as atheists or maybe always did Um, how are they meeting those needs? And they found that there was an increase in people attending sporting events and music festivals and other kinds of like secular community-based events because it ticks the same boxes. You know, when you root for your favorite sports team, you feel a sense of purpose, a sense of hope, Mm -hmm. a sense of joining and belonging and identity. There's a lot of the same elements there. And so when, when people are starting to redefine what spirituality means for them, I think sometimes there are uh, big moments of grief that come up and that's to be expected when the worldview that you were told is true, you're now feeling differently about it. And that's to be expected that you would feel anger and grief, maybe even some depression as you Mm -hmm. kind of make sense of what this was and isn't now in your life. Um, But, you know, really sort of thinking about what were the aspects of your religion or your spirituality that felt really important to you, to your point, minus the shame, Mm -hmm. minus the rigidity, minus the high control? And can you redefine a a connection to a higher power or to um, a community or to something else that really does give you a sense of joy, hope, 
purpose, connection, support, mm -hmm. and harness the positive things that can come from a religious community. Absolutely, absolutely. And within that too, thinking about cultivating communities, because this is one thing that is really hard within Christianity that is, or, or high control religion at all, you're only allowed to be friends with people right. that are in the religion. Yeah. And how you judge if someone is good for you relationally, romantically, or platonically relationally is if they're Christian. Like I remember growing up in here, well, they're a good person if they're a Christian. Like that was like, it's, and so coming out of that, it can be really hard to start to determine mm -hmm. what is a safe community because mm -hmm. you've been taught if they have this label, they're safe. Mm -hmm. And so really being careful and cautious of like, Am I, am I believing this person just because they're telling me something about them? What do their actions say? How is it lining up? Is this a, is this a friendship or a romantic relationship that feels safe for me? Mm -hmm. um, you're allowed to use judgment mm -hmm. and you're allowed to say, this doesn't work for me. Yeah, that's so important. So important. I mean, part of um, why high control religions <clears throat> can be so dangerous is that isolative. Mm -hmm. um, demand, right? And, and that demand to stay within an insular community and not have a lot of exposure to people who don't identify in the same way. And it's dangerous in these communities. It's dangerous in abusive relationships. It's an intentional faction of mm -hmm. high control relationships, whether it's interpersonal or community-based. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so recognize that you are allowed to choose and like I think that can be really hard too recognizing that you have autonomy mm -hmm. is a very hard thing to realize and that also comes with grief of all the years that you didn't but yeah. grief is integral to pleasure we can't experience pleasure if we don't experience grief so like move through the grief it's okay so to true. have grief so true so true thank you so much Rachel for coming on the podcast today and for sharing your story and some additional information about Reclaiming pleasure after purity culture is so important. Thank you. Intimacy starts with being curious. At the end of each episode, I'll be answering your questions. I love interacting with all of you, so please keep the questions coming via TikTok, Instagram, and our website, or you can email questions at modernintimacy.com. I'll include your name attached to the question unless you ask me not to. So tune in to hear if your questions get answered here or on our social media pages. Okay. Let's get curious together. Dylan R. asks, what's your number one advice for men to pleasure women? Well, what I would say is that if we're talking about cisgender folks, people with vulvas are not a monolith. So my number one advice would be to talk to the woman that you are having sex with and find out what she likes. Everyone's different. That said, most folks really appreciate clitoral stimulation, and at least 15 minutes of foreplay or outer course, because it takes a little while for vulva owners to be fully aroused. Take the time to get to know the erogenous zones of your partner and spend time pleasuring your partner by touching them in different sensual ways or really learning from them what they like. They might not like sensual touch. They might like different kinds of stimulation, but ask and listen and then play. Thank you for listening to the Modern Intimacy Podcast. On Instagram, follow me at Dr. Kate Balistrieri and at The Modern Intimacy. On TikTok, check me out at Dr. Kate Balistrieri and on Twitter at Kate Balistrieri. Everyone has questions about mental health, sex, and relationships. Send yours to me via DM on Instagram or email them to questions at modernintimacy.com and I'll answer some at the end of each episode. Visit the website, modernintimacy.com, to schedule a consultation with a member of our team or to sign up for our newsletter. Let's meet back here next week. New episodes air every Tuesday. Reminder, this podcast is for education and entertainment purposes only and is not a substitute for mental health services.